Praise God. Well, we're going to continue with the message we started last week. Open your Bibles. First Kings. Elijah from ecstasy to agony. And as we talked about last week, Elijah was used by God. He is one of the most prolific people in the Old Testament. There's few people in the Old Testament that are surrounded by as much, you want to say, supernatural manifestation as Elijah. He prophesies a multi-year drought to, the, uh, to Israel. He supernaturally then is led away and he's fed for weeks by ravens. They literally bring him, uh, it's um, Uber, I guess delivered, I don't know, you know what I mean? It's, Take out and deliver. Hallelujah. He then goes to the widow woman and supernaturally multiplies the flour and the oil for her and her son. They're, they're, about to, they're ready to die. They're in the middle of a drought. It's believed that at least seven to nine months had gone by by the time that he got to the widow woman. They are in the middle of a drought. She's making the last little cake for her and her son before she dies. And he says, would you make me something? And she does. And he honors her by then giving her flour and oil, which never went away until the rains came years later. That's pretty cool. It says that in the Bible. He resurrects the widow's son. He's dead, and he, he resurrects him. Hallelujah. Calls down fire on a sacrifice to the false prophets of Baal. Then kills the false prophets of Baal, all 450 of them. The God that answered by fire, that is the God. And they spent all day trying to get all their pagan gods to answer their prayers, and nothing happened. Then he runs 16K, hallelujah, 16 miles. And he runs so fast that he passes up King Ahab in his chariot, all the way back to the city limits. So this is a guy that is experienced the power of God, and in all fairness, he's never known anything, if you want to look at it, but great success. Behind every good man, there's a woman, and sometimes behind some good men, there's some bad woman. Jezebel is a bad woman. She is evil. She is rude. She, she hates God. She is a paganist priestess that married King uh, um, Ahab, and King Ahab is completely backslidden. He's completely given Israel over to idol worship, and he's built altars for these idols. Uh, the Baal worship idols are being literally built with his permission, but she is the driving force in the government of Israel. And she sends a message to Elijah that by this time tomorrow night, you will be like the false prophets of Baal. In other words, you're dead. She's she's. From, from the king's throne, technically, from, the, from the, the throne room of Israel, so to speak, the kingship of Israel, there is a hit out for Elijah. Now let's go to 1 Kings 19, 3 and 4. We may have to chop this into two messages. I was hoping to get through the whole thing today. I don't think I will. What do you guys think? How late do you want to be here? Okay. Amen. So Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Once he heard, got the message from Jezebel, he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, and while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Elijah is really bummed out. Will Elijah remain in deep depression? Is Elijah doomed? Will Ahab's troops find Elijah and kill him off? He's completely out of gas. Will Elijah starve to death in the wilderness? Will the prophet ever be used by God again? How will Elijah find water to quench his thirst? Can Elijah find a therapist in the middle of nowhere? Will God forsake the burned-out prophet 
find out today, this Lakeshore place, this Lakeshore time. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Kings 19, 5 through 8. 1 Kings 19, 5 through 8. So he lay down under the bush and he fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then he laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> Amen. Wow, angels minister to him. And you see, even in his depression, I want us to see this. He is bummed out, he is depressed, he wants to die. He says to God, I'm done. Take my life. It's all over. But even in his depression, do you notice that God has not ignored Elijah? An angel is there to minister to him, as at times in our lives, believe it or not, there's been angels that have probably ministered to you. You just don't know. The Bible says that angels can minister to us and we can be unaware of them. And when we get to heaven, I really believe, if you wonder, what are we going to do for eternity? I really believe that God's going to show us through our whole lifetime all the things that were going on in the spirit realm around us that we were totally unaware of. I think he'll show us times and places that, that we were ministered to, and we just didn't know it. So angels minister to him. And here again, Food and drink supernaturally, again, okay? Forty days and forty nights is very significant. Who are two other Bible characters that forty days and forty nights was pretty significant? Jesus, who else? Moses. Moses and Jesus and Elijah. So this forty days and forty nights, the Bible doesn't go into any deep, exegesis of what is happening here, why 40 days and 40 nights. But whenever we see that 40 days and 40 nights, we know it's significant. We know that whenever God is going to do something big, he, he, we know with Jesus that 40 days and 40 nights was significant because when Jesus came out of that fasting and that prayer, his miraculous ministry started. We know with Moses... 40 days and 40 nights, what did he do? For, well, 40 years in the wilderness as well. Okay, but what, what happened? What did we get? We got, the, we got the covenant. Got the Ten Commandments. And you know what the joke is? Who's the, who's the person in the Bible that broke all Ten Commandments at once? Moses. Okay, amen. Hallelujah. All right. He has led to probably Mount Sinai, Hebrew and Mount Sinai. It's believed that it's one and the same. But the word of the Lord comes to him again. And we need to understand that the beauty, even in his depression, apparently he still can hear the voice of God. Because there's times that when you're depressed, there's times that when you're down, you think you can't hear God's voice anymore. But I want you to know that you cannot get so low that God honestly cannot speak to you anymore. Because you see, the love of God is deeper than your depression. Whatever hole you think you're in, God owns the dirt under the hole. Amen? So he, he's, he's already places that you underestimate that he could be at. So he's ready to minister once again to him. 1 Kings 19.10 says this. And here's what he replied. He said, well, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down the altars, and they've put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And I believe Elijah goes through what sometimes we might feel like we go through, that we're the only one left. Now, the difference between Elijah and many of us in all fairness, 
to human experience is that Elijah, for the most part, has completely obeyed God. Many times, we are in situations where we know we have not completely obeyed God. But I'm telling you, God is the same God to the person who I believe has been a little bit more faithful, like Elijah, and to us at times when we have not been as faithful as we should be. God is the same God. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So his mercy is equal to you as it was to Elijah. There is no difference. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Elijah believes he's the only one left. Now, when you truly start serving the Lord, there will be opportunities for you to suffer for Christ, and they may be very small things. It might be something like everybody in your family used to go somewhere and do something that was inappropriate. And you have to make the choice to say, hey, I have no problem being around you guys, but I can't go and do with you this, this thing. Oh, you're little Miss Two Shoes now. You're, you're, little, you're, the little, you're the little righteous one. And who are you to tell us that we can't do anything? And you're not telling anybody what they can or can't do. You're just simply saying, I just can't go with you anymore. I knew a guy who lived in Cleveland, and he was uh, for years but nearly the manager of a, of a shop. And uh, he got saved, and he stopped going to the nudie joint on, on West 150th with the boss. He used to go there every weekend, Friday night, watch the girls dance. And uh, after he got saved, he couldn't do that anymore. And he told his boss very politely, he said, listen, I've given my life to the Lord, and I'm not judging you in any way, shape, or form. I'm just telling you, I can't go with you anymore to, to that. And the boss just started teasing him, and all the other guys in the shop, they would mock him and laugh at him and whatever, and, and he just he kept working, he kept doing the job the best he could. And, of course, when a promotion came that the boss told him just six months earlier he was going to get, no matter what, he gave it to one of the other guys that goes to watch the dancing girl. So he never got that promotion, and eventually he had to leave. It, it just got so bad that he had to go. I remember when I first got saved, I told you the story about that one day I was in, in C lecture, and uh, not C lecture, I was in the library, and I had a, a pile of Bibles that I was going to hand out that day, and three guys on the football team back in 1972 came up and took all the Bibles, took them to the rubbish can, and, and just one by one just ripped them to shreds and put them in the rubbish can. An hour and a half later, I was having lunch, and while I attempted to just bow over, quietly bow over my lunch and pray, I felt sporks hitting me. And, and all the kids at the table next to me were laughing and, and calling me Jesus freak and whatever, whatever. And, and, and so even as a young man, I experienced what it was like. I felt very alone. You know you're not, but I felt pretty alone. So it was an amazing experience when I was able to go to the Billy Graham crusade in 1972, when it was at the old Brown Stadium, amen? And anybody that's been to any of these new stadiums, you don't know nothing unless you've been to the old Brown Stadium. Boy, that place was classic. <laughs> that place was really, it was classy, okay? But to be there with 20, 30, 40,000 people night after night worshiping the Lord, let me tell you something, I was encouraged. There's times we need to know that we're really not alone. There's times we, we need to go somewhere just to, to be around people. I, I, I remember it was in its big time about 20 years ago, and, and I remember going to Three Rivers Stadium, and, and uh, you know, the Browns and still had a real football team then, so there was a little, I had a little bit of issue going to Three Rivers, but we went. And 40-something thousand men there just praying and loving each other and worshiping God. It was such an encouragement because, men, there's times we feel like we're the only ones in the world that are trying to live for God. We're the only ones in the world trying to be pure. We're the only ones in the world trying to love our wives. We're the only ones in the world. You know what I mean? You feel that way. So there's times and there's places. Well, we need to be fair with Elijah. He wasn't able to go to a promise keeper yet. <laughs> Because in his culture, there weren't that many people keeping the promise. So he, he's, 
He's very alone. He's watched for years the history. And he's watched for years how they've even responded to the drought. And people are not repenting and mass to the Lord. The rebellion has continued. And now he believes it's all done. God, take my life. Go back to 1 Kings 18.22, it says this. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Now even though they were defeated and destroyed, there's just something about even the way he says it. I'm the only prophet of God left. Baal has 450, and sadly, Jehovah only has me. So, it is never fun to feel like you are the only one doing the right thing. But in this culture, if you're going to do the right thing, you're going to have to experience times that you are the only one. I'm not saying you're the only one, but it's going to feel like you're the only one. When everybody else is doing one thing, and you know in your conscience, I just can't do that. When everybody else thinks one way, and you know because the Holy Spirit has revealed Christ to you, you know enough of the Word of God so that you know the way you, you, you have to think in certain directions. And if the whole world is against you, you know that you have to take a stand. And when I say take a stand, I'm not even talking about in front of others. I'm talking about in front of you. Simply taking a stand to yourself. I'm going to serve the Lord. If the whole world doesn't serve him with me, I've got to try to serve the Lord. Because you see, until you serve the Lord by yourself, you may never be able to serve the Lord with anybody else. If you've noticed, obedience is not a crowd thing. Getting a crowd was never something in the New Testament that I saw Jesus. Man, let's just have a crowd. Let's just get a crowd. Let's get a PR firm. Let's text everybody ahead of time. Let's get a Twitter, everybody on Twitter, let, let them go wild. We're going to have this big miracle thing, and everybody's going to come and get all wound up. Everybody's going to get all hyped up. It's not what Jesus did. In fact, Jesus, he kind of behaved in ways, it was like he was trying to get people to not like him so much. Jesus, why did you say that to those Pharisees? <laughs> Things could have gone a lot better if you just kept your mouth shut there. But you see, Jesus wasn't, he didn't come to win friends. He did come to influence people. Amen? And my point is, is that sooner or later, you're going to have to do things that somebody's going to disagree with it. If it hasn't happened yet, it will. Because if you truly obey God, somebody, somebody's going to be upset. So, as I said, it is never fun to feel like that you are the only one doing the right thing. Now, Acts 26, 17, and 18, Jesus said this. I will rescue you from your own people, he's speaking to Paul, and the Gentiles, and I'm sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. If the world is really full of darkness, which I believe the world really is. Now, if you love the Lord and you're serving the Lord and you're kind of at peace in the Lord, it's not that the world doesn't look like it's dark. It does. But when you're in the, really in the light of the Lord, you're not letting the, the darkness of the world affect you so much. There were headlines when I was young in my faith. There were headlines I would see in the news that would really throw me for a loop. Now nothing throws me for a loop. And I'm not being critical. I'm just being honest. I see nothing in the news that throws me for a loop. There's no, no weird thing going on in the world that surprises me anymore. But i got to be honest with you. At one time in my walk, things really surprised me. Things really got me all upset. Things really got me discouraged. Now when I watch the news, it, it, I'm, I, I, nothing I don't like m much of what I see, but I'm not knocked over anymore. I understand what's going on on this planet. But at the same time, I'm encouraged about what God is doing 
And remember, CNN is not going to tell you what's happening. They're not going to tell you that hundreds of thousands or millions of young people have taken a pledge of purity uh, before marriage. They're not going to tell you that there's countless people that, 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 that love God and, 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 and have repented of their sins. They're not going to tell you how many people didn't commit suicide because they trusted God and they came to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not, the, the good news is not going to sell that. So you're only going to hear about some errant pastor or about some priest pedophile or some person here and some person there. So you need to understand you are not going to find the good news in this world. The good news is found in the Word of God, hallelujah. From page, from the front to the back and in the middle, hallelujah, hallelujah. And from, from Genesis to Revelation and flyover country, hallelujah, amen? There's good news in the good news of Jesus Christ. And that don't sell papers, but it saves souls, hallelujah, amen? Woo. <laughs> hallelujah. It makes sense then that Jesus actually calls us the light of the world. And we're uncomfortable when Christ said things like that to the disciples. He said, you are the light. We know he's the light of the world, but he told them, he said, you are the light of the world. And you don't take a light and hide it. You take it and you put it somewhere so that the light is seen. Hallelujah. And he encourages us, us he encourages us, rather, to let our light shine before men. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Now, let's go to 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13. 1 Kings. And it'd help if I got there too. All right, First Kings nineteen eleven through thirteen. And remember, a few weeks ago, when I completely lost it at the beginning of the sermon, I I was all confused. All I had to do was read the verses up there that I thought weren't it, because they were. All right, those verses in Hebrews eleven were talking about Abraham, and somehow I just. I didn't, I was so connected to the study from the Old Testament that when I put those verses in, I forgot I put them there. So when I saw them, I thought it was from some sermon somewhere else. So praise the Lord. So, hallelujah. Just, I, I wasn't as far off as you thought I was. Okay? All right? Amen. Now, 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13. Okay. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain at the in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and a powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then after the earthquake came fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Wow. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. So there was this wind, there was an earthquake, and there was fire. Not to be confused with earth, wind, and fire, a bluesies pop band from the late 70s. Don't get confused, okay? But there was this manifestation. God was showing Elijah once again, because remember, Elijah is familiar with the dramatic. Not everybody experiences that. Very few of us will experience the dramatic. But trust me, God is the God of the dramatic. Amen? So Elijah might be hoping that God is going to send wind, earthquakes, and fire to judge those he has sent, he's been sent to. Because you see, he's so tired of them not listening He's so tired of giving them warnings, and they ignore it. And the bottom line is, God took care of the false prophets of Baal. Why doesn't God just take care of the whole rest of them? I mean, if God destroyed the false prophets, why doesn't he just knock everything over? Now, what's weird is the Lord showed him his power in the wind and the earthquakes and the fire. But there's something missing. Amen? In Luke 9, 53 to 55, we see that Jesus had a little bit of issue with some of his disciples that sound familiar. 
But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. And this was an area of Samaria, and Jesus was on his way back to Jerusalem, and he told the, the, the apostles to go and, and to, to prepare some things there. And they went to this area of Samaria, and, and they didn't want anything to do with it. So listen what they say. So the disciples, James and John, saw this. Here's what they said to the Lord. Now picture this. Jesus is walking around, okay? Jesus is walking around like in the movies. It's like he's on one of those railroad tra things, you know, okay? That's not how it was, my friends. Jesus is walking around, and look what they ask. Um, Lord, would you like us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Oh, this is some real ministry dynamics going on here, isn't it? Now, how did the Lord answer? Yeah! We're going to have us a sinner barbecue. No. It's short and it's sweet. And here's what Jesus said. He turned and rebuked them. You see, sometimes disciples think they have a handle on the way that God's going to handle us. And sometimes we're really wrong. James and John, these were two pretty cool guys. James and John, this, is, this isn't impetuous Peter. This is James and lovable John. John was such a lover. He just loved, 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 loved. Let's call fire down on him. Anybody is capable of a bad day. But Jesus rebuked them, and he just kept on. It sounds like he didn't even stand around and explain anything. He just rebuked them and moved on. They knew, whew, wow. It's not what he was thinking, was it? I told you, John, it wouldn't work. Hallelujah. Amen? All right. So, after the earthquake, the wind, and the fire, something else happened. Something else happened. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the wind, and he wasn't in the fire. Let's look at 1 Kings 19.12 once more. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper, and the King James Version calls it a still, small voice. You see, Elijah has been so familiar with the dramatic and with what he considered to be supernatural. He was forgetting, as James and John were forgetting, that it is the Holy Spirit of God that speaks to the hearts of men. I'm not saying that God can't do a dramatic miracle to get our attention, but ultimately we are called to repentance, not because of a mountain that's blown apart in vengeance, but we are called to repentance because our conscience has been touched by the Spirit of a living God, hallelujah. And every one of you that's come to Christ, you came that way because God spoke to you and you heard his voice. Very few of you came out of some powerful demonstration. Many of you, it was in the quietness of your conscience that the Holy Spirit spoke to you. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Let's stand. Hallelujah. 1 Kings 19.15 The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, anoint Hazael over Aram. God says to the prophet Elijah, here's what he says. Get back to work. Because really, that's what's happening. Ultimately, he says, get back to work. They've already seen the fire. They've already had the wind. They've seen the drought. But God let them know that my voice is still speaking to the hearts of men. And the hope was found in Elijah. Because you see, if Elijah can hear the voice of God, anybody can. Because you see, God is not a respecter of persons. You know, God doesn't sit in heaven and look down and say, oh, man, <clears throat> you know, I want to find just really nice religious people to do all my stuff. No. You know, God's looking down from heaven. You know what he says? 
anybody, anybody who believes, anybody. I don't care what their background is. I don't care if people like them or don't. I don't care if they're at the top of society or at the bottom. I don't care if they're rich or they're poor. I don't care if they're not the, the, the smartest or the sharpest axe in the toolbox. Thank God. There's hope for us. Amen? I don't care how gifted they are or how gifted they're not. I don't care what the world thinks about them. I'm going to honor their faith. So when someone calls out to the Lord, God, God how do you, you want to get God's attention? Believe. Jesus was not enamored with religious folk that doubted him. He was enamored with even people that weren't religious at all that believed. The, the, the young ruler, when he came, and he said, you just say the word, my servant will be healed. You don't even have to come to the house. You just say the word. She said, whoa, I haven't found faith like this in all Israel. The Samaritan woman at the well. It didn't matter where we come from because it's all about where we're going. We're not saved because we came from anywhere except sin. We're going to heaven because Jesus Christ, hallelujah, loved us and called us away from the sin of our past and the failure of our past. And now he's put us. I love cruises. He put us in a fellowship. We're allowed to be in this ship together. <laughs> Hallelujah. 1 Kings 19, 18. And this is the good part. Remember he thought he was all alone? The Lord sets him straight. Elijah, dude, you thought you were all alone? You thought you were the only one? Yeah, I understand your circumstances, but you're missing something here. You're, mix, you're missing 6,999 others that in Israel whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Praise God. So you need to know that no matter what you think, there's more to the process than you know. <laughs> That's why we have to humble ourselves to God because he knows everything. I can't help it that God knows everything. I know some people don't like the idea that God knows everything. I like the idea that God knows everything. Because somehow, the craziness of our lives, somehow there's got to be some pattern. There's got to be some purpose. There's, somehow we gotta be, we got to be on our way to something better. And I really believe that in the sovereignty of God, there is better things in store for those that love him. I'm not saying bad things won't happen to you. Bad things will happen to you. I, I am, you know, these people, oh, just, I remember what, when I first got saved and, and, you know, a lot of hippies and everything were getting saved. It was a great time. But, but there was some evangelistic models that weren't real effective. Just come to Jesus and everything will be wonderful. Well, I came to Jesus and a lot of things weren't wonderful. And the closer I got to Jesus, the less wonderful a lot of things got. You lied to me. Yes, some things become wonderful, but understand what I'm saying. Jesus, do you notice he never told people, just come here, everything's going to be wonderful. Come on, just come here, you're going to get rich, you're going to get beautiful, you're going to have a natural facelift, you won't even need to go to the doctor. <laughs> you're going to have oil of Olay, I'll give you a 55-gallon drum, you can dip yourself in every day, you're going to look great. You're going to smell great, look great, act great, everybody's going to think you're wonderful. Jesus never talked like that. You know what he said? Hey, if you follow me... They might kill you and think that they're doing God a favor. Oh, that's a way to win people. Pick up the cross and follow me. You know, but those Samaritans, you got some people group in the world you don't like? Okay, those are the ones I'm going to send you to love. Thanks, Lord. I was perfectly happy until I complained to you about that neighbor down the street or that people group. And now I'm going to be a missionary to them, huh? Yes. Don't let your imagination go wild. The Lord's listening, amen? But do you understand what I'm saying? In the Bible, God never teased people to get to him. He, he spoke the truth. 
He gave them an unbelievable challenge that in their own strength, they cannot do, they can't accomplish. You cannot do what God has given you to do without God. Father, we want to give you the praise. We want to give you the glory for this beautiful day. Lord, I thank you and praise you that you're moving in our lives and our hearts. Is there anyone here this morning you would say, Pastor Jim, I need to just make a fresh commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every week we've been seeing people committing themselves and getting saved and and, and some filled with the Spirit. What do you need today from God? Is there somebody here today you say, I need to get closer to the Lord. I've been a coward in some areas of my life, and I need to, thank you, and I need to become valiant. Thank you. I need to become valiant. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Anyone else? Five, six of you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Let's pray. Father, for these that have raised their hands, I pray, Lord, that you give them valor. <laughs> give them strength to live for you. Deep in their conscience, in their heart, they know. They know who you are and they know you're right. So God, help them and help us as a body to authentically live for you. I, I just want to, as I get older, I, I don't want to be a successful pastor anymore. I want to be, I just want to finish authentic. I want this to be real. I want it to be real. So God, help us to live in a way that our faith in you is real. It's really, really real. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Praise God. Give God a praise.